بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على عبده ورسوله وخليله وصفوته من خلقه نبينا وإمامنا وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سلك سبيله واهتدى بهداه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد We're still going through the nullifiers of wudu. The author said, وَالنَّوَاقِدُ فِي الطَّهَارَةِ الصُّغْرَى ثَمَانِيَةِ There's eight nullifiers of wudu. The first one is, الْخَارِجُ مِنَ السَّبِيلَيْنِ Anything that exits from the two private parts. The second nullifier is, وَالْفَاحِشُ مِنْ غَيْرِهِمَا What exits from other than the private parts, that's repulsive. The third nullifier of wudu is, وَزَوَالُ الْعَقْلِ بِغَيْرِ نَوْمٍ يَسِيرٍ جَالِسًا أَوْ قَائِمًا Loss of consciousness nullifies wudu. That's by ijma. So he says, sleeping takes the same ruling, except light sleep while a person is sitting or standing. We took four opinions last week as it pertains to this mas'ala. What's the mas'ala? The mas'ala of does sleep nullify wudu? What were the opinions that we took last week? The first one is that light sleep while one is sitting or standing doesn't nullify wudu. This is chosen by the Hanabila and it's the op uh, op opinion of the author of the book. And it's the madhab of the Hanabila. Number two is that sitting firmly on one's bottom does it nullify wudu? Everything else nullifies wudu. The third opinion is that all sleep voids wudu. The fourth opinion is that sleep doesn't nullify wudu in salah. We stop there. We'll start on the fifth opinion, which is the only type of sleep that nullifies wudu is when one lays down or leans on one side of his bottom. And Ibn Abdin attributed this to Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. The proof that they used is a supposed hadith in Muslim Ahmad. It's weak. There's really no need to mention it. But because it's popular when discussing this matter, among Talabat al ilm when discussing this matter, one should know it in case it's presented to him. In al wudu ala yajibu illa ala man nama muttaja. Fa innahu idha taja istar khat mafasiluhu. Wudu is not required except when one sleeps laying down, when one's reclining. Because when one lays down, his joints or muscles relax. And now we said it's weak by ijma' of the ulama of hadith. The second alleged hadith is attributed to Hudayfa radiallahu an that he said, my head used to drop in sleep or in drowsiness. So I asked the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, should I perform wudu? He said, no, unless you lay down and that's also weak. A third one is, مَنْ نَامَ جَالِسًا فَلَا وُضُوءَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ وَضَعَ جَنْبَهُ فَعَلَيْهِ الْوُضُوءَ Whoever sleeps sitting down doesn't need to make wudu. One who sleeps laying down, whoever sleeps sitting down doesn't need to make wudu. One who sleeps laying down must renew, renew his wudu. That's also weak. Similar in meaning is other narrations like the one in Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba, لَيْسَ عَلَى مَنْ نَامَ سَاجِدًا وُضُوءُ حَتَّى يَطَّجَعَ فَإِذَا اطَّجَعَ اِسْتَرْخَتْ مَفَاصِلُهُ There's approximately two or three more with similar meanings. They're weak. There is, however, an authentic author in Musannaf Abd al-Razak that Ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما, when he used to sleep sitting, he wouldn't renew his wudu. When he slept, on his side, he would renew his wudu. The response to that is that it's an author relating the action of Ibn Umar, not a hadith. 
Second of all, this action may be interpreted that when he lays down, it was the type of sleep where he loses his ihsas, his awareness, to the point he wouldn't know if he passed wind. And when he was sitting, it was the, it's interpreted to be the sleep where he maintained his ihsas to the point he would know if he uh, committed the hadath. And that goes along with al-rajah. The sixth opinion is that sleep is not a nullifier of wudu at all. And this is the complete opposite of the third opinion that we took last week. Some attribute this opinion to Imam Ahmed. Al-Khalal, we mentioned his status in the Hanbali Madhab. He said that is incorrect. It's also attributed to Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib and others. Their proof is, Ya ayyuhal the first, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu idha qumtum ila salati faqsilu wujuhakum wa idiyakum ila al-marafiq wa msahu bi ru'usikum wa arjulakum ila al-ka'bayn. They said, Sleep is not mentioned as a nullifier in the verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in that verse, أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ مِّنَ الْغَائِطِ One defecated as a nullifier. But sleep is not mentioned in that verse. The response to how they used that verse is, number one, the verse includes some, not all the nullifiers of wudu. Wudu is nullified by a person being unconscious or by urinating. That's by ijma. Yet they're not included in the verse. So the verse details some of the nullifiers, not all of them. A shafi'i in al-um also said, I heard those who I trust their knowledge in the Quran claim that, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu idha qumtum ila salati, O you who believe when you rise up for salah, faqsilu wujuhakum wa He said, it, they said it was revealed pertaining to those waking up from sleep. Qumtum ila salah, waking up from sleep. So he's saying the verse was revealed according to some who he trusts their knowledge pertaining to those waking up from sleep. So how can one say they're not included in the verse? Regardless, the verse mentions some nullifiers, not all of them. The second proof they used is the hadith, hadith Abu Huraira. لا وضوء إلا من صوت أو ريح There's no wudu except for a sound or a smell. No wudu except for a sound or a smell. They said the hadith didn't include sleep. The hadith is actually referring to someone thinking he passed wind while he is in salah. Like we said about the verse, applies here. There's nullifiers like urinating, defecating, falling unconscious, all nullifiers by ijma, by consensus, and this hadith doesn't mention them. This hadith is mentioning the ruling pertaining to what one does if he doubts that he nullified his wudu by passing wind while, is in, while he's in salah. It's not limiting the nullifiers of wudu to sound and smell as it may appear. It's just showing that's how you figure it out if you doubt you pass wind while in salah. The third one is a rationale they mentioned. Their proof is a rationale. They said, since sleep is not a hadith in of itself, but because it may cause one to pass wind without knowing it, they said, so a person's tahara, his purification is established by yaqeen. Whether he passed wind or not is a doubt. You don't leave that yaqeen of being on tahara due to a doubt. They said that's like someone who passes or thinks he passed wind in salah. He doesn't leave salah due to the doubt. And that's why the hadith says only if you hear sound or due to a smell. The tahara was established by certainty, by yaqeen, and you don't leave salah thinking you passed wind. It has to be by yaqeen. The response is, there's a hadith like hadith Safwan, and the one who told us not to leave salah, if one is in doubt of passing wind, is the one who said to make wudu 
when one sleeps. The fourth proof is a hadith, and it's the hadith of Anas radiallahu an, an Qatada. قال سمعت أنسا يقول كان أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ينامون ثم يصلون ولا يتوضعون. This hadith, this version of it is in Sahih Muslim. Qatada said, I heard Anas saying that the Sahaba dozed off and offered salah without performing wudu. Their rationale is the Sahaba didn't make wudu in that scenario after sleeping. So there's no wudu from sleep. Otherwise, the Sahaba would have performed wudu. The response is, some ulama responded saying, they didn't make wudu because they were firmly sitting on their bottom. And it's obvious the ones who made this rebuttal are the ones who support the opinion of uh, exempting one who sits firmly on his bottom. But there's another narration, like we mentioned, that they were laying down. So ulama, like Al-Qurtubi said, it's light sleep. And that's very accurate, and it's very correct. And it coincides with the rajah that we mentioned. They also used the fifth proof, Hadith Anas, أنه قال, أقيمت صلاة العشاء فقال رجل لحاجة فقام النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يناجيه حتى نام القوم أو بعض القوم the people got up to make salah. And a man said I, he needed to speak to the Messenger وسلم, about a need he had. And the Messenger وسلم, had a private conversation with him until people or some of them dozed off, then they made salah. Ibn Hajar said that it wasn't deep sleep because there's other narrations that prove it wasn't deep sleep. Other narrations like the one in Sunan Abu Dawood that says, فَقَامَ يُنَاجِيهِ حَتَّى نَعَسَ الْقَوْمِ Not actual sleep, but rather drowsy. A sixth proof that they use is in Sahih al-Bukhari on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha قالت أعتم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بالعشاء حتى ناداه عمر الصلاة نام النساء والصبيان عائشة said the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم one time delayed the عشاء until عمر رضي الله عنه reminded him by saying the صلاة women and children have slept and then the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم came out علماء gave numerous responses to this some said this hadith doesn't clearly indicate they didn't make wudu. Some said it was drowsiness, not actual sleep. Others said they were firmly sitting on their bottom. Some said it was before the order of making wudu from sleep. With all those possibilities and scenarios, it can't be used as proof to show sleep doesn't nullify wudu. Another proof that they mentioned, the seventh one, I think, is Hadith ibn Abbas, the one we took. فَجَعَلْتُ إِذَا أَغْفَيْتْ يَأْخُذُ بِشَحْمَةِ أُذُنِي The one where he slept at his aunt's house and he said the Messenger وسلم, would grab his earlobe when he dozed off in salah next to him. They said he slept in salah and it didn't nullify the salah. And we already explained that hair, it's drowsiness, not, not full sleep. He didn't lose his ihsas, his awareness in it. The final and last opinion on this matter is that long sleep nullifies wudu in every setting, while short sleep doesn't nullify wudu. This is the opinion of Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, and another opinion of the Hanabila. Their proof, First of all, is the proof for general uh, sleep nullifying wudu. And they used for that Hadith Ali radiallahu an, al ain wika usah, faman nama faliyatawadda. The hadith that we said is weak, where the eyes were compared to a leather strap or string uh, that ties the anus. So whoever falls asleep needs to perform their wudu. That hadith is weak. 
let's assume it's authentic. It would be taken collectively with other ahadith to mean deep sleep, where one loses his ihsas and awareness. Just like other ahadith with similar rulings where the Sahaba didn't make wudu after sleeping, that's taken to mean that it was light sleep. And this here would be meaning deep sleep. The second proof is Hadith Anas. They said that the Sahaba used to wait for Isha to the point that their heads dropped, those enough, that they would make salah without performing wudu. And in Musnad Abu Ya'la, they used to lay down. It was laying down. The fact they didn't make wudu, they said, proves and indicates that there is a distinction between long sleep and brief sleeping. And there's a difference between the two. Long sleep requires wudu, while light, brief, uh, or actually brief sleep doesn't require wudu. They said Hadith Anas, with its different narrations, sitting or laying, is for short sleep. And here, let me mention the story that Ibn Abdul Bar related. Abu Ubaid said, I used to give the fatwa that one who sleeps sitting doesn't nullify his wudu. He said, I continued to give that fatwa until some man sat next to me in the masjid and passed wind while he was sitting and sleeping. Abu Ubaid said, I told him, get up and make wudu. You passed wind. The man began to argue with Abu Ubaid and he went to the extent of giving an oath that he didn't pass wind. Then he even accused Abu Ubaid of being the one who passed the wind. Abu Ubaid said, and that's when I changed my opinion pertaining to exempting someone sitting from having to make wudu if he's overcome by heavy sleep, even if he's sitting. That story fully supports the Rajah. One may be sitting firmly on his bottom, but still pass wind. A third proof that they use this hadith of one Ibn Asal radiallahu an, kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ya'muruna an la nanzi'a khifafana thalathata ayyamin illa min janaba, lakin min ghaitin wa bawlin wa nawmin. Hadith of one Ibn Asal radiallahu an indicates that sleep negates wudu. Short sleep is exempted when taken together with hadith Anas. This is responded to in the Hadith Ali and Hadith Safwan. There's no differentiating between long and short term sleep. None of those hadith specify anything of that. The more appropriate route is the route of loss of ihsas awareness, not the length of sleep. They also used Hadith Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah when he slept at Maimuna's house. فَجَعَلْتُ إِذَا أَخْفَيْتْ يَأْخُذُ بِشَحْمَةِ أُذُنِي And now we said, when Ibn Abbas slept next to the Messenger وسلم, in Salah, that's drowsiness, not full sleep. Al-Rajih is what we mentioned in the beginning. And within most of the opinions that we mentioned, we showed through their proof the strength of the opinion we selected. A hadith that indicate sleep nullifies wudu are taken to mean sleep one loses his ihsas in it. He loses his senses and awareness to the point he wouldn't know if he passed wind. Why? Because that's the reason that sleep even became a nullifier. A hadith that indicates sleep doesn't nullify wudu is like drowsiness and slumber where one maintains his ihsas, his awareness and senses that if he committed a hadith, he would know it. It's also a rajah because with that opinion, the ahadith on this subject are all taken collectively. The reason for going by maintaining ihsas of hadith instead of one's physical setting 
how he sleeps, is that all the various ahadith have various positions on how they slept and then they got up and made salah without wudu. So you use them collectively by knowing the standard is awareness, ihsas in one's sleep rather than the physical status one is sleeping on. Also, when one is firmly sitting on his bottom or laying down, one can pass wind in those settings. In, for example, sitting, the story related by Ibn Abdul Bar is clear and accurate. And the whole point with sleep is that it's not a nullifier in of itself. It's because it's means for passing wind. So if one dozes off and is alert, he's alert to the point that he would know if he passed wind. That means he doesn't need to make wudu. The opinion selected is also supported by the hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim and the authority of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah about the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa slept until he breathed deeply. And it was his habit that he breathed deeply when he slept. Then he got up, made salah, he didn't make wudu. And that's because the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa is alert. His eyes sleep, but his heart doesn't, so he's alert. He'd be aware if he committed a hadath, if he nullified his wudu, sallallahu alayhi wa That's the end of that mas'ala. The next issue is that, and I probably mentioned it briefly within the previous uh, mas'ala, is that when someone loses his mind due to some type of insanity or falls unconscious or is intoxicated, loses his mind in any of that, he has to make wudu. Someone faints. He goes in a coma. He takes medicine and he overdoses on his medicine. He accidentally overdoses on his medicine and passes out. Or he has a seizure and passes out. Some have tragic episodes where they lose their mind and then they get, regain it shortly thereafter. Loss of mind, junoon, zawal al-aqil, nullify wudu. And one must renew his wudu by ijma'. It's not like sleep. The ijma' pertaining to junoon and insanity or ighma' and unconsciousness is related by ulama like Ibn al-Mundir and Ibn Qudama and al nawawi None of that is disputed with the slight exception of a dispute by a shafi'iyah pertaining to stages of what nullifies a person who's intoxicated wudu. And with that, we'll conclude with this matter, uh, the matter of sleeping in wudu, or sleeping and being unconscious. And next week, we'll start with the fourth nullifier of wudu, touching the private part.